Jack Lifton is the senior editor at Investor Intel, and Jack, you certainly don't need any introduction to our audience. But <laughs> welcome via Skype to the Investor Intel uh, studios here. Um, you're going to be in Toronto soon for the Minds and Money show. It's uh, yeah. September the 28th. Uh, the exact dates are um, the 26th to the 28th. And okay. uh, what are you going to be talking about? Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, recycling uh, automotive components, particularly batteries, but also any, anything that can be recycled containing technology, metals, and materials. Uh, that's stuff you've been writing about for some time. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to give us some themes that you're going to be talking about within that? Uh, yes. I, I, I'm uh, very surprised that we have. there's been so little re uh, talk and action in North America about recycling lithium ion batteries uh, for vehicle use, for very large batteries, when in fact the governments of both Canada and the U.S. mandate that cradle-to-grave management of these materials. In other words, they consider these batteries to be a uh, safety hazard if they're outside of the car and just handled. So they want to know when the car is returned, uh, where does that battery go? And right now it goes to the junkyard, and where is it going? So uh, there's sort of a crackdown happening in the U.S. And, and uh, I'm hearing from people, well, you know, this is very early on. There isn't much material. There are thousands of tons of these of these batteries already heading for scrap. The, the largest individual maker of electric uh, vehicles in the world is Nissan. And the best-selling uh, electric vehicle in the world is the Nissan Leaf, which is made in Smyrna, Tennessee, not, not somewhere in Japan. So uh, those cars along with Teslas and various uh, other uh, Japanese and uh, makes are on the road. They do have long lives, but they, they've been around long enough. There's enough of them. Uh, a typical battery on one of these cars can weigh half a ton. So it doesn't take very many of them to, to create material. And, and again, I'm, people are saying to me, well, you know, lithium is so cheap. Why would you bother? Well, lithium may be cheap, but where's it coming from? We, we don't produce enough of these lithium, cobalt, and uh, what's called spherical graphite in this country or in Canada. I'm, I'm in the U.S. Uh, we don't produce enough in North America to make all even a fraction of the vehicles that Mr. Musk is planning, tells us he's going to be making just in the year 2018. And, and I've got big news for everybody watching. Uh, there are at least 20 or 25 electric Vehicle, electrically, directly electric powered vehicles and hybrids coming onto the market in the next five or six years. They're coming from Europe, the U.S., Japan, and China, and Korea. So there's going to be lots of these things around, and right now, uh, as some people like to say, we seem to have our thumb up in the wrong place. Nobody's doing anything. They're just talking about it. I'm very familiar with this in my lifetime in uh, commodity materials. People talk about it, and they feel so good when they're done talking, but they don't do a damn thing about what they're talking about. Well, this can't go on. And I, I'm saying that I've been looking at recycling, and recycling conserves something even more important than metals. It conserves energy. Why are we going to use the amount of energy used to produce a new commodity metal or material from the ground? Is, is, is and should be the highest amount of energy ever expended for that material. That's why the U.S. steel industry today is, is majority dependent on scrap as a feedstock. Why spend all the energy to, 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 to bring new iron into production, into production when you've got plenty of material left that can be produced at much lower energy? And uh, I decided to make it as a theme, uh, peak energy. It's not that we, we can't produce more energy. We, we can light off atom bombs and burn the whole world. We get a lot of heat that way. That's not the point. It's we are saying in our culture, we don't want coal, we don't want oil, we don't want this, we don't want that. Okay, we need a certain amount of energy. I call it the base load of energy for commodity materials production. That is coming today from coal and oil and some from nuclear. 
Solar fields, wind farms cannot produce enough electricity, for example, to run an aluminum foundry, which is a huge eater of electricity. So, more and more electricity is being consumed in air conditioning. I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, some, in some African countries, 20% of their total energy production is for air conditioning. In the U.S., it's just a miserable 6 to 10%. Imagine that. Of all the electricity produced, that much goes for air conditioning, which we can't live without, correct? Even though the American Secretary of State says we shouldn't use that except on his yacht or his Bentley, I guess. But we're not supposed to do that. So we're going to keep doing that and if we reduce the amount of energy we're producing, how are we going to prioritize our use? Well, the environmentalists say, well, just stop mining. Great. Okay. Well, then uh, where are they going to get the metal to make, you know, their the trailers that they live in or whatever, <laughs> however they survive? Uh, we're reaching a, pro a, a problem point here. I mean that. Where energy distribution, prioritization, it's becoming, people are, are ignoring this. I, I cannot think of anything offhand except perhaps heating ourselves. It uses more electrical energy. You've got light, heat, and metal refining. People forget about that. Electric arc furnace steel is what we, is what we produce in the United States. Aluminum is entirely produced by, by electrolytic reduction of materials. And smelters are run. Uh, plasma arc furnace smelters for recycling lead. Those are uh, electric. Now, if, if we're going to reduce the, the, our, our amount of energy, when are we going to address the base load issue? And how much energy must we have to maintain our society? Now, that's for you younger guys to worry about, not me. But what I'm saying is I'm going to tell you a way to do it. Let's recycle every place we can. And please don't talk to me about the price of a kilogram of metal. You have to capitalize the environmental, the energy savings, all of these things, and the social value. Then you can tell me what the actual cost is. So those people who think that uh, digging up uh, uranium in the middle of Kazakhstan is a great idea, it may be, but not for the Kazakhs. We have to conserve. By the way, we, we, could, we can also recycle nuclear fuel. We don't do that. Instead, in the United States, we have 114 depositories at each one at each nuclear plant where we bury this stuff and forget about it while our politicians say, well, you could have an earthquake in a million years in Nevada so that we can't store it down there. Why, in the year 1 million AD, it, it could spill into Las Vegas. I mean, the stupidity of this is beyond belief. So recycling is, to me the topic of, of our time. We have this. Uh, every time I go to China, they, they say to me, why do Americans waste so much of their resources? I haven't got an answer for that. But I, I can tell you that the, the public is not well informed on this. The days of uh, easy flow of metals and materials is, is over. We have to conserve. And when I say conserve energy, I don't mean turn off your air conditioner. I mean use less energy to produce the basic raw materials you need. End of speech. Well, speaking of producing the materials, you follow the technologies that the yes. mining industry. What's, what's new there? Well, I, I'm watching the, the evolution of uh, process technology in, in mining and, and metallurgy. And the theme there is less energy use. For example, as, as we know in the rare earths there are three new technologies. There's there's much better solvent extraction technology that's been developed. There's molecular recognition technology and there's continuous uh, ion exchange technology. What do they all have in common? They use a lot less energy than the traditional methods of, of refining metals. And this is going across the board. Uh, just the other day, uh, I saw that uh, the scientists at MIT, the, the man who invented what's called the magne liquid magnesium battery. This is a uh, device that has about 20 tons of liquid magnesium in it. And even though most of us recoil in terror or something like that, because if magnesium hits the air, it really does burn quite nicely and you can't put it out with water, Hawaii has commissioned two of these monsters uh, to, to smooth out their wind and solar, to actually store it. The, now, these are not going to be used in cars or homes anytime soon, but this gentleman, 
Professor Satterway of MIT. I shared a stage with him earlier this year in Japan. He, dis he, he admits publicly, he discovered by accident a new way of refining technology metals. As he was, uh, I, I would say, playing around, as he was researching his smelting operation to purify the magnesium, he discovered that some of his processes were producing high purity metals as a byproduct. And then he realized that he's got a, he's got a new low energy way of producing metals like antimony, bismuth, things that aren't so commonly known. But this is this is only announced in the last few days, and it's it's a dramatic improvement in in the in the production of high purity metals of that type. So things are happening all of the time. But as you know, Fred, the path from the discovery and the laboratory bench to being able to buy it in the local uh, Tim Hortons takes a while. Oh, yeah. Like about a lifetime or two. But it's underway, and I don't know why, but North America is just shining in this area. Innovation and mining and metallurgy is, is just going at light speed in Canada and the U.S. And I'm following half a dozen companies that have really good technologies. What are they fighting? You go to uh, a mining company, and they say, gee, we've invested a billion dollars in refining platinum this way. You're telling us we should just shut that down and use your stuff. But you see, the only cost we've got is maintenance and, and occasionally changing a part on this stuff. Because we don't have to do it, but we'd have to spend a lot of money to put your stuff in. So I'm, I've said this until I'm blue in the face. A new venture for any technology metal. Look at the new process technology. Do not cost it out with the giant smelters or the inefficient solvent extraction plants. Those are the past. You can do much, much better, and you'll find a lot of projects with that we wrote off in the last 10 years are economical when you look at state-of-the-art technology. And yes, somebody's got to be a guinea pig, but isn't that always the case? Jack, you, you, you talked eloquently about our need to do more recycling. What yes. is the recycling status at the moment, and who are the big players? Well, the problem is I'm talking about recycling technology metals. And if we call the platinum group metals technology metals, and they certainly are for catalysts, uh, that's the most recycled material there is. I, I, I suspect that if you take platinum, palladium, and rhodium, uh, every bit of it that we can recover uh, from, from uh, end, of, end of life is, is, is recycled. Uh, steel recycled you you couldn't recycle any more steel okay uh, lead today about 85 percent of the lead we use is is recycled from batteries actually uh, america is the biggest user of lead and one of the smallest miners and people say how can that be that's because we recycle all of that stuff so the what i'm getting at is with the exception of the platinum group metals which are rare technology metals the base metals are recycled very efficiently. This is capitalism working. It has nothing to do with anybody wanting to do anything good for, for society and the environment. It's about making money and saving money. Now, we are not recycling germanium, gallium, rare earths, tellurium. The, and we need these things, but they're not very sexy and the public isn't aware of them. They're just words. But in, in, the, in the mass production of consumer goods, they're critical. And, and I think that we can no longer pretend that we live in a globalized world and that all you have to do is pick up the phone and order some stuff from China, raw materials, and it'll be delivered. That doesn't work anymore. I, I, what I see everywhere, I've been all over the world this year, and everywhere I see local development of supply chains, total supply chains. I was in Brazil, and all they were talking about is they're already mining rare earths. They mine uranium. They have a lot of things there. Iron, obviously, the whole country is made out of iron. And they are talking about vertical integration. Okay, the Japanese and the, the Japanese, for example, have no, as you know, they have no raw materials. Koreans have less than the Japanese. They're all over the world, not just buying mines, but developing mines integrating them into refineries and then end, end use products and, and manufacturing. Japanese do this up for survival. The Koreans do it for survival. What do we do? We say, yeah, we'll get it from them. Well, you know, um, 
as those parts, Japan is a well-developed consumer society. They're probably not going to have any more demand except for wheelchairs and things like that. But China, wow, are they, are they going to have some consumer demand? And India is sitting there waiting to explode. And quite frankly, Africa may happen before India. Africa has a billion people on a continent. India has a billion people in a place the size of Canada. Uh, these are markets that are ready to go. And when and our technology materials come from those regions of the world because we don't bother to produce them here from uh, newly. When those people start using their own material, they're going to give us the high sign and say, you can have what's left over. And there isn't going to be anything. If we don't start recycling, uh, we're going to have to decide who gets a television set and who gets a car. You may think I'm nuts, most people do, but <laughs> I'm telling you that is exactly what's going to happen. There's no way out of it. We have to recycle to make up our law, what we don't produce, new, new, new material. Now, lead, as we do, steel, we do that, copper, we do that, commodity, fine. Why don't we do it with technology metals? Because the volumes are small, and and if you're just processing them as part of like the copper supply chain, it, if you stop producing copper, you stop producing technology metals. Very simple. But now with new process technology, there are cheap ways to do this stuff, especially for recycling. Even ore residues or concentrates, things where all these things have been sitting for years, they can be processed with these new technologies. I think that uh, institutional investors, I know that the ones I talk to, don't even want to talk about anything unless it involves technology. They're, they don't want to talk about mining. They want to talk about vertical integration. They want to know what, how is somebody going to produce something you can sell to the public from this. They, they're not interested in a hole in the ground or a green field with a grab sample. That's over. They want to know what do you know about the supply chain and where do you plan to enter it and how are you going to do it? We had, a, we had a, one or two people in the last 10 years in the rare earth circus who said things like mine to magnet. That was silly. Making magnets is very complicated stuff. It's, it, even the best geologist doesn't know how to make a magnet, nor does the best magnet maker know how to, how to find any minerals. The, these require a lot of people a lot of techniques, a lot of married technologies. You can do it, but you don't do it just by announcing you're going to do it. Uh, lately, we've had some of our uh, junior miners say they're going to go into exotic things like specialty alloys. And I'm looking at a greenfield site and saying, so from this, you're going to go to aircraft components and rocket motors. And all. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Well, I don't believe that either. I, I'm, looking, I'm looking for companies that will produce where they, to where they can make a profit. If you want to vertically integrate, you better join up with other companies that know how to do what you, what you need done. You can't just have a one-stop shop. That doesn't work in high tech. And we've been pretending for the last 10 years that if, if there's rare earth in that mountain, then I've got a magnet. You know, that's ridiculous. We need to examine the business models and the plans of these companies and say, so, you know, you're, so you're going to produce this material that's going to be used to make magnets. So where are you going to sell it? Who are you going to sell it to? And is that profitable at that point? You're going to sell mixed concentrate? That's not profitable. You're going to separate it. Okay, there's some profit there. You make metals? Yeah, that's profit. Alloys? Magnets? Motors? I mean, who in your company knows anything about this? Oh, oh you read about it. And what I love, 43101, you had a marketing study signed off by a qualified person, okay? And now you know how to do it. This is nuts, okay? I mean, I can say this because I'm an old guy, I don't give a damn who could criticize me. But for God's sake, how can, how can a financier hold his head up when he listens to that baloney and says, oh yeah, this, that's a great idea. It is not a great idea. You need, we, we have left out the important part of this of this thing, sure, commodities, uh, uh, technology, metals, whatever, that's a great business. But where do you make a profit? Not digging out of the ground unless it's gold. That's about it. The rest of it, it has to go downstream. You need to either hire a lot of people, bring in technology. And then as my final thing, I want to say something. 
You produce a product. Let's say it's a magnet. Well, let's see. General Motors takes three years to approve a new magnet, and then they also want to approve your factory, look at your finance, make sure they don't have to lend you money to stay in business. And that takes, so by the, between the time you, you know, you, you locate a mineral on the ground and you're selling something to General Motors, about a decade. So stop pretending that, you know, the price of your shares changes by the day. If you're lucky, if it changes by the year. And we need all these things. Our people who actually use these rare materials don't know where they come from. Okay, so we do need to have mining, refining, etc., but it has to be profitable. And I'm saying, and I've been saying this from the first day, why not start to be in the rare business or the platinum business or the cobalt business by recycling? Now you've got a product that somebody wants. Now you, you can add to it with new production and pretty soon you would be a valued supplier because you, you'd be able to deliver an amount every, every 30 days. Where problem with recycling is who the hell knows how much you're going to have on a given day. So add that to a mine. You can't just have one thing. You have, you have to think of who you're going to sell it to and what you're going to sell. So I'm waiting to hear the first, you know, uh, junior venture tell me this, but I haven't heard it yet. Jack, always thought-provoking. <laughs> yes, yes. Just scaring me a little bit. But thank you very much. You've given uh, us lots to think about. Thank you, Fred.